Yeah, and you already have yeah. yeah. no, 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 no. I'm looking at it. Yes. That doesn't work either. That might be messing with, with you guys. Yes, I think she is. It is, uh, it is 7 o'clock, and I don't have my gavel, otherwise I'd use it. But uh, we are in our new location for the first time, so welcome everyone to uh, what will be officially soon the District Administration Center after we rename it tonight, I think. Oh, it's first read tonight. We won't prove that until next time. Sorry. Uh, we're going to start like we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance. Matt and Cameron. I don't know if Cameron's going to help out or not. Yay. They're going to lead us if you can stand and join us. Oops, sorry. Can you get you as much here? There we go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, guys. move to honoring accidents 2.02 and that thank you very much mr connor it's an honor to be at the podium in our i'm the first to be at the podium here in our new location so uh glad to to be here tonight for honoring excellence i'm going to begin by inviting a couple of uh, uh special students to come join me here at the podium skyler allen montana grizzle Step right up and stand here. <clears throat> Kim Marie, I know, uh, joined me out at Liberty North the Friday just before spring break, May the 14th. Um, uh, really neat event out at Liberty North on that Friday as uh, these two uh, incredible student leaders spearheaded a campaign uh, titled Bury the R Word. Uh, some of you may have saw some media coverage on this last weekend. Uh, Fox 4 uh, ran a uh, feature on, uh, I believe that was Friday evening, um, after the event. So as I'll do every now and then, um, I thought it would be appropriate to uh, play that story that aired on Fox. I do want to apologize. Uh, I guess all the audio uh, pieces aren't set up in this room as of yet, but uh, Kurt has uh, assured me that uh, he will crank it up as loud as he can in the back and I apologize in advance to the folks uh, nearest to the computer in the back <laughs> of the room so at this time let's uh, uh, check out the hurt story. And that's story what students Fox at Ford. one local high school say about the slang word retarded they're encouraging their peers to cut it out Fox 4 Sean McDowell has more from Liberty where they're burying the R word every student deserves respect Two students at Liberty North High School, seniors Montana Grizzle and Skylar Allen, are leading a student-based campaign to end the use of the word retarded as it pertains to the slang use of the word. The two went as far on Friday as to hold a mock funeral and actually bury the R word. Saying the R word should be a very easy thing to end. The two students even obtained a donated tombstone from a local mortuary. Allen says it will serve as a permanent reminder that students should take a stand to defend the mentally disabled. It's become such a norm in our society to use the R word in that derogatory way that we've decided that it's okay to use it and we are here to say that it's not okay. The sign? Students issued their support by signing this pact, agreeing to end their use of the derogatory term. Grizzle says she helped start this push after a family member was diagnosed with Down syndrome. We wanted to accept everyone for who they are and to create a culture of positive language. This was a really special occasion. Jenny Ravel Jones helps manage the school's gateway program, which offers a chance for the mentally handicapped to transition from high school into the working world. One person person using positive language can make a difference. Um, one person can influence everyone to create a more positive climate. 
at Liberty North High School. Allen and Grizzle say they're pleased that the majority of the student body at North High School has agreed to sign that pact. Sean McDowell, Fox 4 News, working for you at Liberty North High School. So obviously just, uh, just a really neat campaign that they led. Uh, not only the, the event on Friday, but all the events that led up to that, that they uh, successfully accomplished at Liberty North High School. And uh, I got to experience it a little bit uh, from my perspective in the fact that they were all over me, wanting to get me to come out and meet with them on the publicity end of it. And that was like two weeks, three weeks before. I mean, these guys are organized uh, just to the max. And um, they are, are special, special leaders. And we thought it was certainly um, appropriate to honor them here this evening. So at this time, let's give them a big round of applause. have some certificates for you. <clears throat> and we'll be sure to get a photo with the two of you immediately after this. Now, Miss Katie Lawson, time for me to get to embarrass you for a moment. Where are you at, Katie? Come on up. Stand next to me over. <laughs> Many of you may have seen in recent weeks um, the news that Katie made, and we always like the positive news, and that was that Katie was chosen as the Clay Platt Region Assistant Principal of the Year. Uh, Katie has been with LPS for 15 years, nine of them in uh, her role, or nine of them at Lewis and Clark Elementary. Um, and if you... Uh, didn't see the article on our website, uh, be sure to read that, but today I just pulled a quote from their principal, Dr. Uh, Kyle Palmer, who said this about Katie. Katie has a desire to help all those around her and to support students, staff, and parents. She is a phenomenal problem solver and amazing with building relationships with all those she works with. So uh, Katie is a lifetime Liberty resident. Her mom and dad are here to support her tonight, along with uh, her husband now has arrived and a, a couple of the boys. And uh, she's just, uh, uh, just an incredible role model for all, so positive each and every day. And uh, anytime I need to learn something or, or find something out about Liberty, I go to this lady right here, Katie. Uh, she, she has uh, just tremendous knowledge in our local community. And a little story, um, some of you that are our Facebook fans of our district Facebook page, occasionally I'll put a different story about someone up on our page and it'll get 10 likes, maybe 20 likes. Uh, I put Katie's story up. Katie got 367 <laughs> likes and 89 comments giving her support and congratulations. So that tells you a little bit about the pop that she brings to the table. So she is awesome. So uh, tonight, Katie, we just wanted to uh, public recognize, uh, publicly recognize you and, and uh, congratulate you on, on this award. Let's give her a big round of applause. So congratulations again to all of our recipients tonight. And uh, again, we'll be sure to get your photo taken immediately after this. And uh, that concludes Honoring Excellence for this evening. Very good. Thank you, Dallas. Uh, we would, uh, we always take a break after Honoring Excellence and what to shake the hands of those we've honored tonight. So if you would stick around for a few minutes, we'd like to do that. Right before we break, though, um, I want to remind everybody that if you'd like to address the board tonight during the public comment section of the meeting, there are blue cards, and I usually say right outside the door, but I don't know where they are. In the They're, right outside the door. Door. They're right outside that door. <laughs> uh, if you'd fill one of those out and hand them to somebody up here, uh, we'll get you on the agenda to speak before the board. And um, again, Skylar Montana and Katie, if you'd stick around. Uh, right before we break, though, I would like to introduce the people who are running for school board seat. There are three positions open um, on the board. The election is April 8th, so we encourage you to vote that day. 
And when I call your name, if you would stand and remain standing until I get through the entire list, and these are in ballot order. Angela Reed, Jesse Limekuller, Lori Tritz, Kim Marie Graham, Don Hubbs, and Bruce Cantwell. Thank you all. Okay, at this time we're going to take a break and then we'll have a clock come back. Uh, let's take about nine minutes here. Let's come back at 7.20. If I had a gavel, I'd do that. So we'll reconvene. And uh, it takes us to approval of the agenda, 2.03. We have a motion. Does that effect? I move the board approve the agenda as presented. Is there a second? Second. If no further discussion, Sandra, you call roll. Bren? Yes. Charlene? Yes. David? Yes. Kim Marie? Yes. Andy? Yes. Lori? Yes. Scott? Yes. Motion carries. Very good. That takes us to 2.04 public comment. I did not receive any blue cards. Did anyone else? If not, we will move on to 2.05 committee organization reports. Returning from audit finance. The Audit Finance Committee met electronically this month. They have the next physical meeting will be in this room on April 14th. So all documents were reviewed and... And they're meeting here as well, not too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Anything else on 2.05? If not, Bryn, this takes us to <laughs> what is likely your final yeah. consent yeah. agenda. <laughs> you need to do your because consent, your consent disclaimer. Let me get it for you. Hang on a second. Oh, here it is. Hang on just a second before you do that. Here it is. Okay. Our adopted rules of parliamentary procedure, Robert's rules, provide for a consent agenda listing several listing several items for approval of the board by a single motion. Most of the items listed under the consent agenda have gone through board subcommittee review and recommendation. Documentation concerning these items has been provided to all board members and the public in advance to assure an extensive and thorough review. Items may be removed from the consent agenda at the request of any board member. So, knowing that Mr. Abbott is rolling off the board and not running again next month and we will, I believe we do the reorganize before we get to this portion this will be the final time that Mr. Abbott makes this motion. So, whenever you're ready. I move we approve consent agenda items 3.01 through 6.02. Is there a second? Three. 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 Six point zero three. I'm sorry. You messed it up your final time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we didn't have a second yet, so we're good. Second. Do we have a second? Charlene, a second? Any discussion on consent? Seeing none, Sandra, recall roll. Bren? Yes. Charlene? Yes. David? Yes. Kim Marie? Yes. Andy? Yes. Lori? <coughs> yes. Scott? Yes. Motion carries. Very good. That takes us to 7.01 policy revisions. Dr. Yes. Uh, you know, this is the time of year where MSBA, we get our first round of updates uh, from the last legislative session, the last uh, federal legislative session, the things that have come out that require tweaks. Uh, so this is first read for a number of those. This is not all of them. Over the next two to three months, I would expect to see, you know, five to ten per month uh, so that we can have all of those done by June is our uh, goal at this point. These are all just first read. They deal with anything from uh, salary to student allergy issues, board meeting processes, voting methods, all of those things. Sometimes they're just clean up in words. Legislation is done. Sometimes they're MSBA legal recommendations. Uh, as you read through them, you'll see the highlights. Uh, make sure that you take time to review. I know you've already done that to begin with, uh, or started doing that, but this is uh, just first read, so if there's anything else you need us to know, we'd send them through administrative review before we send them to you uh, with the team members uh, that, that are responsible for this part of the, those parts of the organization. But if you have any questions between now and next month, let us know. Anything we need to pull off or anything we need to relook at, we'd be glad to do it. Also, you also see that there's a few administrative procedures Obviously, those are just administrative processes, kind of help you understand how we do business. Uh, they aren't uh, for board approval, but just for your information. So, first read, uh, nothing to act on tonight. Study, take time, feedback to 
myself, Bob, Carol, or Sandra, if you have any questions, we'll revise and be ready for a new set again next month. So, very good. Any other questions on this agenda? Topic? If none, that takes us to Section 9, New Business, 9.01, Renaming of the District Facility. Yeah, and we have uh, a new, or a, not a new facility, but a current facility, obviously, that's changed purpose at this point and continuing to change purpose. But uh, as we close down the current district administration center and renamed it EPIC, uh, this one uh, is currently Blue Jay Tower. But I feel like since this will be the district administration center, we need to identify it as such uh, for clarification of uh, being able to point people in the right directions. Obviously, this will have enrollment center, HR, academic service, superintendent's office, board office, all of those things in this site once we're completely done. Uh, so it seems logically titled district administration center so that we can uh, clarify and we're not just Blue Jays anymore, so Blue Jay Town doesn't necessarily represent an entire district. Uh, so I think District Administration Center does. So uh, this would be first read on that. If you have any feedback, let us know. Uh, but that's the proposal from administration to shift this to identify it with its purpose and what it's actually doing. So. Should, should it be LPS, District Administration Center, or just District Administration Center? Or up here. I think the other Good one was referred to as District Administration Center. Uh, Officially, Liberty Public School cool. District Administration Center. Yeah. DAC for short. There we go. That, we I all know, know, it I know what all the short terms are, but if we're going to officially approve a name, I suppose yeah. it needs to have all that in there, whatever we want to have in there. Yeah. So, food for thought. Sure. Nothing that has to be discussed tonight. Yeah, we'll have second read next month to refer, so if there's any or to approve, hopefully, if there's anything you need, let us know. But we'll talk about that and see if we want to go ahead and put that in the official title. So. And probably every school would begin with Liberty Public, Public Schools school. district. Heritage and Middle or whatever. Yes. Right? I mean, it's all Liberty part Public of our schools, system. Heritage. Yeah. I mean, every. But it's not their name, the title. That's it for district renaming, unless you have okay. any other info. Sounds like we're moving on. Let's go to 9.02, compensation recommendations. This would also be first read tonight. Uh, all, we have actually no new action items. These are all first reads, just to give you in, uh, kind of a summary of where we're at with this. And we have Team Liberty members that can help speak to this, as well as Dr. Vogelar and Ms. Embry around uh, our compensation schedules. You'll see recommendation from the superintendent. It actually replicates uh, the recommendation from Team Liberty. No changes or adjustments uh, from the recommendation they sent me this year. And it aligns with the two-year plan that we put into play last year, which was uh, a step and a half last year and a step and a half this year that allowed us to recoup one of the two frozen steps uh, over a two-year phase for anybody that's eligible for that. And you have, still have to be eligible to meet the criteria in order to make that happen. That's for all certificated, all administrative, uh, and all classified employees. Also, uh, in that was the same, the conversation, and this is just so you understand the total big picture that we were going to cap uh, increases and in benefits at 5%. The good news is they came in lower, uh, so we allowed them to kind of bank that and hold that for next year uh, because they then came in at 2.4, so kind of the, the expenditure expected projected for next year is somewhere uh, at cap of 7.6. We hope it comes in lower than that again and we continue to be able to live in that uh, healthy world, but you never know if that's going to play out, but that's the budgeting number that we're using to make sure we balance this year and as we proceed forward into next year. Uh, so you'll, you'll see a summary of the cost of those things uh, in your uh, packet, the step increase, the horizontal movement projected, and those are all just projections, obviously. When people move in, move out, uh, retire, uh, those costs go up or down, and those will be uh, more firmed up once we get uh, all employees placed and payroll in September. But this is an estimate of uh, what that motion would require. You'll also see uh, some other supporting documents. Um, Kimberly, Lori, Bob, Carol, anybody else can uh, chime in and talk about the recommendation if you want. Any questions on this? No action again? Yeah, just the first read. To hope to put it into place next month. Okay, if nothing on this item, uh, we will go to report from the administration, 10.01. We do have a few program evaluations tonight, and I think uh, a couple other reports from the executive directors, so we'll ask them to step to the podium and bring you up to speed.
starting. <laughs> Just two very, very quick things from me. Uh, we are looking at um, a variety of programs and research and what other districts do in terms of prevention and how, um, how that may look a little different next year as we move forward without a preventionist um, on our staff. And we're kind of excited about looking at that and doing something differently through our health classes and through counseling and the work that the social workers do. So, in fact, some leaders are coming together this week to talk about what changes might take place. So, um, that's one change I wanted to make sure you were aware of. And then also, the community group known as LCHAT, which is um, the hospital, the county, Parks and Rec, and the school district. Um, uh, L LCHAT actually stands for the Liberty Community Health Action Team. Um, we will be doing a pilot with our middle schoolers of 40 kids and then later survey 700 middle schoolers um, to look at how they use their time after school, their nutritional habits, some of their social interactions, and how those things contribute or don't contribute to childhood obesity. So that's our biggest part is to do this survey and that's the plans are for that later this month possibly in April, because we've gotten started, no fault of our own, but started a little bit later on the Did you have questions about anything? I have three items to report tonight from secondary education. Um, first, I would like to publicly thank the teachers and administrators who um, did a lot of work with um, focused interviews with um, students, parents, and graduates um, for the Vision 2020 work, and they are Michelle Howron, Shannon Lawson, Kara Geiser, Jeff Braden, Sarah Wickham, Dr. Adams, and Dr. Jacobs. So thank you for all of the work that went into that project. Um, the second item is a pilot for advanced sixth grade mathematics is being developed for the upcoming year for Discovery Middle School. There are some teachers, and um, Dr. Moore and Ms. Dickerson are working on the pre-AP mathematics pilot for sixth grade for next year. Still in development, but um, a group of parents is interested and involved in that as well. And the final item is the Secondary Advisory Council. The first one meets tomorrow, and that's the agenda that you just received that went around the table. Um, that is a group of teachers, students, administrators, community members, and parents who will be meeting um, on a quarterly basis to give input into um, current topics um, that are affecting our high school. So you have the agenda on the back side of the agenda, you have the mission, um, the purpose, and, and the configuration of the members. And then the final thing from secondary ed tonight, I wanted to point out, it's in the mission critical commitment section of our board report, but Colleen Jones has done a phenomenal job with college and career relationships, and she has really um, probably eight to 10 different partnerships that she listed that I included. But I wanted to highlight a couple of things. First, the, the Liberty Small Business Network has adopted DECA at the high schools as their mission and are partnering closely with both high school DECA organizations, those advisors and those students to um, make some really powerful things happen. One is, um, I believe, a walk or a marathon. I would be walking, other people may run it. Um, <laughs> that will be their first big project. And then um, during professional development, our unconference on March 7th, she had a panel of business leaders from the Kansas City area and over 80 teachers chose to attend and hear from those business leaders exactly what it takes to prepare students to be career ready in, in this day and age. So, any questions you have? We're an easy crowd. <laughs> I have just a couple of things for you. First of all, this is a big week for Epic Elementary School because the enrollment has obviously closed and actually we've sent off the applications. Over 900 parents or 900 students uh, were entered into the lottery for enrollment to Epic Elementary. And so we sent those off to our demographer, which is a, an individual who's trained in randomizing and, and making sure that the process for selecting students is is fair and uh, just uh, out of our hands and in their hands and then they send us back who has been selected and so so we are going to be notifying parents of uh, their either being on the list or not being on the list and it's a win-win for Liberty students because all of our schools are excellent uh, but I think uh, 
it will be an exciting time for, for students and parents to learn uh, if they were selected for Epic Elementary. And again, we'll be letting them know this later this week, by, um, and we'll be uh, working through that process of making sure we have uh, all of the bases covered before we actually communicate, because uh, that's, that's an important process. So, so everyone that signed up will get something? Yes, this week. exactly. This week. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. And uh, we have just a, we're almost completely done with the staffing for Epic Elementary, so we're working through that process. Uh, we have just a couple of positions left, and, and those are part-time positions, and so we have to make sure that we can get the right people for those and make sure it fits with our system uh, in just the right way. Um, you can re read my report regarding elementary education. Uh, one big thing that occurred uh, this last week for kids, it's a big deal, I was out in classrooms today and I know it's a big deal to them, is we switched devices for our pilots and so the students that had iPads got Chromebooks and, and vice versa and so uh, the kids get excited and yet they didn't want to give up their device. So whatever device kids have, they love. Uh, but uh, it was fun to talk to them about what they liked about the, the device and actually Ryan and I went out um, and interviewed kids uh, for the if you saw the article in the Tribune, uh, the kids did an awesome job of just communicating to, to Ryan Dittmer uh, the pros and cons of, of what they were working with and all of that. But it is an exciting time for students and for education because technology now is affordable and it's, uh, it makes a big difference. And again, uh, I want to thank the patrons for making that possible because it's because of the levy that, that we're able to do this. So if any pa parents are listening or patrons, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we had a focus group uh, meeting and so Kim Ray and Lori were at that uh, luncheon and so that's just a mid-year check-in with, with the pilot teachers, making sure that we're listening to them and uh, just having discussion about uh, how to move forward and it's, again, an important time in our district. Just uh, one other thing. I want to talk about the library uh, program evaluation just briefly, mostly to thank Andrea Sumi, and she's in the back, and she's here to help answer questions if you have any questions about the library uh, program evaluation. She did an excellent job. She and her team did an excellent job of summarizing all aspects of library media services. And uh, you know, one of the things that I noted just in my notes as I was reading through that program evaluation is just uh, I wanted to say thank you to her and her team for embracing the digital transformation because uh, the library media services can either embrace that or resist it uh, because it is a change for how they do things. And they've embraced it and they've increased their digital books or offerings uh, from a thousand to over five thousand which allows our students who have devices and many more students will have devices allows them to access those books online through their device or at home that's the one area she said that they can improve and it's to be expected is that right now only 31 percent of the students are using ebooks but that's going to grow. We know that that's going to grow, and they've recognized that as an area uh, for targeted uh, focus. And so that really is my report, the elementary report, report, and then also the program evaluation. Do you have any questions for me before I uh, bring Trey Kotzer up here to give the program evaluation summary for technology? Any questions at all for me? Okay, so it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Trey Kotzer, and uh, the reason Trey is uh, giving this program evaluation is, uh, you know, he's been so instrumental in our digital transformation, and so we thought Trey should be the one to, to just go over his program evaluation. Trey Kotzer, Director of Technology. And I thought it was because John liked my speaking voice, but <laughs> oh well. That too. <laughs> no, as far as, you know, the technology, last year a lot of our work was just around uh, preparing the high schools for the one-to-one -one. and so this fall you know we did that with the high schools and overall I think it's gone very well I mean Marty and April may have different different things to say but I think it's gone pretty well and of course we've had a few things to work out the kinks here and there and 
uh, we will continue to do that and, and do better uh, with each implementation each year. So, but for this year, once we've got that, once we got that rolled out, you know, a lot of the work then turned directly to the middle level and getting the middle level for devices. And then we've already started focusing on the elementary, uh, just getting the density in for the wireless and making sure we have the infrastructure ready to, to handle all the, the things that we'll throw at it, you know, over the next few years. So. Um, we spent a lot of time with that, and then also even with the one-to-one, -to, -one, to thank Andrea and her group. I mean, they're on the front lines when the kids are coming in for questions, concerns. So they've been great to work with. They've been a great help, and so I uh, definitely appreciate that from, from Andrea and her group. Um, Mike kind of touched on the pilots, you know, that we're doing at the middle level and the elementaries with the Chromebooks and the iPads. And so we've got that going. We're basically midway or just a little over midway. We like Mike's there with the focus group. Uh, again, just gathering information and data as we continue this and make our decisions for next year. So it's been a great process so far. Um, the uh, the devices are, are working well, and you know they're not having to worry about the network and getting on. So so that's a, that's good that they could just focus on the teaching and learning and and what works best for them and how they'll use it. And again, as far as professional professional development. Um, Tracy, our instructional technology coach, has been working very hard with the technology mentors, the elite specialists, the coaches. Um, we're partnering with uh, academic services, with um, uh, just th those people, and just doing the best we can to, with professional development and helping people get the most out of the devices that we have and make the most for the money that we spent. So, I mean, that's really what, uh, just from my point, what we've done so far, and we're staying very busy. and. As you can see just from my report, just some of the information from surveys and other information that we've gathered just for some of my responses on there and what we're doing, looking to do, and, and try to do for next year. So any, any questions or concerns? A quick question sure. for you. And, and tell me if you feel more comfortable passing this off. Um, mm -hmm. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, ever since we started talking about rolling out the technology, one of the key phrases the board has heard, and, and of course we don't want to get into, and that's the $1,000 pencil. Mm -hmm. um, and I, this has come out so quick. Um, and I, I have two kids that are utilizing it, and I hear great things about it. But to ensure that it doesn't become the $1,000 pencil, that we do the next step and the step after that, what do you need from us? Um, do you have, is everything in place and you're comfortable with the plan? Or can we do more to help uh, with that? I think it's always a work in progress. Um, I mean, we can do tons and tons of PD, and you're still going to have people who aren't going to be as prepared as others until they get into it and get going with it. Um, I think it's just a continued support for professional development that we do, the work with the, you know, the people like the e-leads and the mentors who help incorporate that, uh, who help teachers with professional development, the stuff we do with the administrators to, to help them feel more at ease with it. And I, you know, the I don't know. coaches at the elementary level, that would be helpful. So you, you feel like you have what you need now, it's just carrying it out? Or is, is there something else you need from us? I mean, there's nothing else that I can think of at the moment. I mean, I think the best thing is you all are very receptive to things that we ask for. So if next month something would come up, we're like, you know what, I really think we would it would be beneficial if we tried this or, or did something this way. I think, you know, as long as we can show to you what we're trying to do and why we're doing it, I think you all will be very supportive. And I think that's been a very good aspect from what we've experienced from you all so far in this One process. Of the biggest things we heard through the focus groups, though, was the second um, feedback sessions that are going to take place is that maybe they need to take um, place sooner than later. Um, just because the teachers um, were wanting to have extra time, whatever device they were going to be responsible for, is to have that ahead of time so that they can um, plan um, during the summer months. And I think if we wait too long, we're going to miss that window to be able to get those um, devices to them so that they can um, uh, not only just play around with it themselves, but then um, know what PD um, they need to sign up for over the summer. Um, or during the next school year. And so I think just moving that time up a little bit, I'm not saying by months, but trying to get that done sooner than later. We're trying to, and that's perfect feedback when we're having that conversation, of when do we make that decision? Because right. really, we don't want to rush the decision and make a bad decision, right. but we don't want to put people, you know, uh, stressed out as we prep right. for rollout. So, and a little bit of this is when does rollout have to occur? Does it have right. to occur August 15th when school starts? Right. It doesn't. So. 
uh, making sure we make a good decision and a good timeline for rollout. It can happen in October. It can happen in December. We made the decision at the high school level to make sure that it happened at, at the beginning of the year. But that there are a lot of rollouts that happen after the first quarter, at the second quarter. So that's the, we just need to process, right. make sure we have a good timeline and a good yeah. rollout implementation so and that I they have comfort. Right. And, and we had a, a tremendous group of people. I mean, it was, it was a good. full house. And um, I think they're also worried about momentum. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, so now we've touched it, we've played, yeah. we've, we've started to work <laughs> yeah. through it, and yep. then to have a lapse of time of between that yep. and, and implementing was of concern. And a lot of the feedback we received as well related to, we can switch these devices, but I think we're probably going to get the same feedback that we received right. because we had a group of iPad users, we had a group of Chromebook, um, and they were interacting, and, and it was, a great feedback session and um, so kudos to um, IT for putting that together but I think I'm not saying we shouldn't evaluate now that we flipped but I don't know that it's going to take as long to make a decision yeah. because we have a lot of good data and, yeah. and data I mean we had great feedback during that session and that's my opinion I, I don't know if you felt the same way no, I think that was a fairly consistent message that we already have a pretty good body of knowledge so if if we can give um, the educators more time with the device in their hands to be prepared, we should do that. Makes sense. Kind of our original goal was to try to get through assessment window, right? So right. April's in tenth, yes. right? I mean, okay. with everybody's focus on uh -huh. making sure we're prepped, right? and then as soon as assessment window uh, gets done, then we bring that body back. I mean, we're collecting data all along the way, but then we bring that team back together to begin to process and make those decisions and build those recommendations, so that we can get it flipped this summer. Uh, so Trey's team has the time to get it in and get it in the teacher's hands so they can start prepping for next year because I've heard the same thing with a few of those mm -hmm. pilot teachers. Man, I, it's been good to be a part of it and I can't imagine going back, which right. is exactly what we want to hear from them. Right. Uh, but we want to make sure that we don't stress everybody else out as we process. So they may be able to keep their technology potentially while right. we process and prep everybody else up. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of those conversations are taking place. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. It's great feedback as we... We've just been talking about this the last two weeks at a leadership meeting, so it's right on target. I just wanting, and, and I think that leads into Bryn's comment about support yep. is we were part of those meetings, which was great because we could be heard. I mean, I would say over 90% of the people were like, it's time to move, let's, let's jump, let's, you know, um, get this implemented. So um, any support that we can provide you, but to hear it was um, pretty powerful. So. Great. Appreciate you being part. Anything else for Trey? Thank you. Great leadership. They've, they've taken on a lot, uh, as well as the entire academic service team. Already April, everybody else that's part of the pilots, uh, and uh, uh, the heart of the work is led by Trey and his team, and making sure that it functions, because it doesn't matter if it doesn't function. Uh, it becomes a waste, uh, waste of resources, and it functions, uh, and it functions well in Liberty because of Trey's leadership. So appreciate his work. Thanks, Rick. H R point oh two. Yeah, flip to H R report at this point, Bob. I think Trey did. Thank you. Uh, attached, you'll see the uh, report from the administration, which has a lot of items on it. But I want to highlight one uh, specifically because it represents the culmination of about two years of work by a fairly large group of individuals that will result in some action items that will come your way in April and May at the end of the year as we get ready for the next school year. Um, in 2012, beginning of 2012, 13 school year, DESE announced uh, seven essential principles for effective evaluations and asked that all uh, school districts in the state of Missouri get in compliance with those evaluation principles by the 14-15 school year. So, we established a cadre of, of uh, certificated staff, teachers, uh, librarians, counselors, uh, administrators to come together in the 12-13 school year and look at our current evaluation system, a performance-based teacher evaluation system, and uh, look at it through the lens of these seven essential principles to determine where we are in alignment and where we are out of alignment. And uh, it was determined that there are three areas uh, where we're out of alignment, only two and a half. There's one area where we're, we're close to being aligned. But nonetheless, we began the work of evaluating systems that would replace the performance-based teacher evaluation and get Liberty's <coughs> teacher evaluation system in alignment in time for the 14-15 school year. Uh, they did that work two years ago, or I guess last year, and it resulted in piloting two systems that we've been uh, piloting this year 
uh, in uh, several of our elementaries and middle schools and, and both high schools. And the groups that are piloting uh, the two systems this year are meeting and uh, conferring to talk about which system will really be best for Liberty Public Schools. Uh, the two systems are the Network for Educator Effectiveness, and uh, that, that uh, uh, model is implemented in uh, the same number of buildings opposite the other system, which is the Missouri Educator Evaluation System. And uh, both pilot groups have been uh, working uh, to effectuate that, identifying pros and cons of, of each model, and then coming together to discuss uh, what would be the best course of action for the school system. The decisions not been made or recommendations have not been made from those pilots, um, but uh, certainly the information is pointing in that direction. We'll probably have a decision and recommendation to give to Dr. Jungman uh, again that would, would result in action uh, taken to the board for consideration. So I want to give you that update and, uh, and really publicly thank the, the individuals that made up those uh, teams, both the teams that evaluated our current system through the lens of those seven essential principles and then the teams that are making up the pilots for both the Missouri Educator Evaluation System and the Network for Educator Effectiveness uh, System that aligns with these seven principles for DESE. So I wanted to highlight that particular part of the report. We talked about several other things uh, there and then we've also uploaded the enrollment numbers, current enrollment numbers. I don't know likes that. Yeah. And just get the current status of our, our student enrollment population. So, any questions? We have 1,015 in the third grade. Unbelievable. <laughs> Bob, are there some key highlights of what is likely to be different in the evaluation system? Well, the, the, the main difference, I think, really centers around um, you know, what is provided in terms of meaningful feedback for teachers. Certainly, our current evaluation system provides feedback. But uh, in terms of meaningful feedback, both systems really anchor it to uh, research-based proven practices for instruction and link that feedback to um, resources that can help equip teachers to grow. It's very developmental. Evaluation systems can be, um, uh, can be very summative in nature, very judgmental in nature, they can be very developmental in nature. And you want to try to find that hybrid that's a good balance of both. And I think both of these pilot systems are really rich in their development. Piece. They have uh, teachers, uh, all teachers that are on cycle, engage in professional development reflection. They identify uh, uh, process standards and indicators that they want to work on based on data that they've examined in their own professional practice. And then they meet frequently with their administrators to gauge progress toward those goals. So it's very developmental in focus. The feedback I've gotten from both pilots, really from both the teachers who are engaging the pilots and the administrators who are doing it, is that they really love this approach because it's much more uh, developmental. Nature. So, um, so, so feedback that you get, you, there's actions that you can take to help address that. Yeah, and they do it in different ways. Uh, one of the systems actually can, can uh, show how the um, uh, assessment, if you will, uh, for the teachers compares to other teachers uh, in their in their building, other uh, teachers in the school system, and other teachers across the state of Missouri, uh, and that is really good, valuable data in terms of helping teachers look through that lens of how, how am I comparing. Mm -hmm. um, and then it links, uh, the, you know, the actual uh, process links, hyperlinks to resources that are available. The other piece that's notable that we don't currently have is uh, a really good process for creating inter rater reliability. And that's something that, that every system, regardless of what you do, you crave, right? You want uh, teachers to, uh, be viewed consistently regardless of who their administrators are. And they're trained to have that inner rater reliability or the reliability that, that no matter who the rater is, they're going to be drawing the same conclusion about the same practice. And both systems uh, really seek that. One system, based on the feedback that I'm getting so far, uh, is really rich in doing that, although the, the, I'm getting very positive feedback from administrators who have been trained in the other system as well. So I would say those are probably the two highlights, the, the meaningful feedback and that uh, inter rater reliability training that administrators receive and then how that uh, effectuates in practice. And, the, and that's the thing that excites me most about it is the training process for leadership to make yeah. sure that we know what we're supposed to be looking for, yeah. we can identify it, and we can do that consistently because mm -hmm. we all know that we've had our classroom experiences, we've had our educational master specialist one or two courses in this, but we've never been trained in inter rater reliability of this process and making sure that we're looking for those key indicators and we know how to help teachers grow in those areas. So this is a whole other level of, I think, administrator uh, development as well as teacher development and, and 
So I look forward to seeing how this plays out. And that train, the administrator training really is what allows for meaningful feedback to be provided. And uh, teachers, you know, they provide feedback on surveys of their administrators every year. And every year, the, the, the one like hungry element that our teachers have across the board is uh, frequent and very specific and meaningful feedback from their administrators. They crave it. Uh, you know, they long for it. And when their principals are in their classrooms frequently providing that feedback, they delight in that. Again, it's very formative in nature. So. And so some of the main work is helping administrators make sure that there's time to have those important conversations, get into the classrooms on a regular basis, do the walkthroughs. Um, the management of the building often distracts us from the work of actually growing our faculty and staff uh, to better serve kids. So helping them make sure that we give them the time and the support to, to grow. Uh, and the structures that allow that to play out as an important part of this work. So. And the idea is that the teacher evaluation will be in place first for the 14-15 school year and what will follow then will be for uh, counselors, for librarians, for administrators, for superintendents. That will run for so hopefully next month we'll bring you a first read of a recommendation between the two is kind of what we're thinking mm -hmm. at this point and we hope to have enough data back at that point. Kind of we can spell out more specifically. Uh, here are the things that this tool brings to the table. Here's what the administration training looks like. Here's all the processes and give you a full report. But just wanted to whet your appetite with what's coming your way next month. So. It, this may be way too specific, but who's doing the training for the interrelated reliability? For the Network for Educator Effectiveness, the training comes with the program. So that's provided by uh, master trainers in the state of Missouri. Uh, for the other one, um, we can either do that in-house or we could go outside for that. Is, is that a web-based kind of Yeah, thing? both trap the data and warehouse the data in a cloud-based system. Because I, I, idealistically, I love that concept, but I worked with a group on establishing, establishing those standards to get that, heighten that inter-related. You should have seen us around the table. <laughs> well, that's what I thought. No, that's not. You know, it's so it'll be a tough thing to be realistic. It just sounds so good. Stop. It is. It Stop. is. And so how how will we really help the administrators to make sure if I as a teacher am at one school and I go to the next one, that there will not be a, a rating this way, and then, okay, they get to me as a principal, and I see things so differently. Do you think that is it? scientific enough that we could practically expect that to happen? Yeah, the systems, we have to expect it to happen because I think it's good for, for education. The systems are designed to distill the research-based proven practices into, you know, quantifiable look for. So when uh, an administrator goes into a room, you know, immediately they can, they can see based on what they're assessing the teacher doing and the students doing. Uh, you know, how that teacher is doing on that particular indicator. There's 36 indicators in, uh, that fall out of these seven principles, uh, 36 uh, standards and indicators. Um, the teachers will focus on, you know, three to five of those per year and establish goals around that. So it really focuses, creates a focus for those administrators on what they're looking for when they go into those classrooms. And, uh, and then they have training around precisely what to look for when they're in those classrooms. So that's the key. The other key to it is frequency. I mean, they've got to calibrate that so they get trained once a year, but then throughout the year they're calibrating on what those reports are in those, uh, with regard to those process standards and indicators. And so that helps. Um, but yeah, the, the systems allow for master score training to be compared to the, the responses that administrators uh, feed into the system when they watch the same viewing and then it shows the extent to which they're on or off from those master scores for what to look for, and then retraining and retraining can result. And so that's how you kind of you know, move that, you, you calibrate that inner rate of reliability through frequency of exposure. But I, kind of the long and short of it, uh, when, when it does come time to, to, to share a recommendation uh, to the board for the direction where he's going to go, I will take a little bit of time to have administrators who engage in the pilot process and teachers who engage in the pilot process to speak about their experience so you'll have a chance to kind of see it directly. Through. I'd really like to see it work, but because <laughs> it's, it's ideal for what we need. Yeah. But but is it possible? Consistent human yeah. observation yeah. is difficult. To yeah. I mean, you're, you're talking about an inherently subjective process, but 
there's very precise research around that process. That plus, if the training is of the nature that I can get it and I can go back and say, oh, this, I can really apply it to this. Almost sounds too good to be true, <laughs> but it sounds it sounds great. So I'll look forward to that presentation. We don't arrive tomorrow, and that's the work. Is you it? don't think? No, <laughs> <laughs> not like on any of these things. But uh, it's a pro it's a process of improvement, and it's the right steps and strides, and we then we grow. Them. And it's the right direction in terms of the point of departure from our current system because we are not very close right now. Data rate. There's a pretty big gap, isn't there? What you're just saying to where we are now. So it's moving toward uh, that ideal. So that's huge, yeah. yeah. Very good. Questions? Any other questions for Bob? That's HR report. More to come next month in detail. So <clears throat> shift to Ms. Embry for finance and operations. Okay. Thank you. Well, in accordance with board policy KH, we acknowledge any donation, $500 or greater, and we have a few of those this month to acknowledge. A monetary donation in the amount of $3,800 to the Technology Education Association of Missouri, donated by Mike Riley to be used for team expenses at the 2014 district and state competitions. An anonymous donation of a student violin, O and case, uh, valued at $600, donated to Discovery Middle School to encourage children to play who might not otherwise have those resources. Multiple monetary donations from Liberty Small Business Network in the amount of $600 to support Liberty High School and Liberty North High School students attending DECA composition, competitions. And a monetary donation in the amount of $500 from Hawthorne Bank, uh, Kent Peterson's name is indicated here, with Hawthorne Bank to support Liberty High School Technology Student Association State Travel. So uh, we appreciate all donations into our system. and. Um, uh, the Liberty School District Foundation equally supports donations as well. Uh, we have our standard financial information. We continue with our balanced budget approach and our fund balance percentage projection at this point in time is 18.36% and that is a very stable fund balance for us. Um, recall that our auditors said 18 to 24 range so uh, we will always look toward improving that but um, focus on taking care of our needs for our staff and students at the same time. Um, we don't really have any new news to report on the state foundation formula level. We we'll, we'll continue to wait and watch and see if any more funding comes our way through that. Uh, on construction, I've provided you with a variety of bullet points that have been uh, fed to us from the managers of each of the site. And, uh, certainly we can delve into any of that, but we had just a few pictures to post this time for your view, and that's also posted on uh, the district website. And uh, I have also information regarding the economic development for the City of Liberty, and uh, I'll get back. We've got posted up here. I'm going to go into that in just a moment. You want to go back to the start? I'll, I'll pop on that at the end. Um, Economic development, the City of Liberty had a meeting on March 19th, and at that meeting, uh, this also is posted as part of the report for you, uh, but there was a hearing to consider approval of a First Amendment to the amendment of the Liberty Triangle Tax Increment Financing Plan that's originally dated September 3rd of 2008, and basically unanimously approved uh, the amendment which will provide for the BME Theater to uh, build a new facility and relocate near our Liberty High School uh, in that uh, area, just north of Liberty High School. And uh, of course, BMB is a fourth generation business and uh, this is their home base. We talked about that at a previous meeting. Um, so they, they anticipate, the good news is they anticipate that it will pay off in 15.19 years. Uh, other, other business in terms of the City of Liberty, um, we did, provide to you a notification regarding a public hearing that will be occurring. Um, actually, it won't be a public hit hearing. It will be a meeting of the city officials to uh, decide on a Chapter 100 taxing agreement for LMB automotive systems, and that basically will be for 10 years, and it will extend, it'll basically double their operation in terms of um, providing a $256,000 square foot expansion. Um, 
the total cost of the project is estimated to be uh, just over $49 million, and the city will issue approximately $49,050,000 in bonds for that. Um, the cost to Liberty Public Schools with regard to the uh, $9,088,000, <coughs> excuse me, is um, the value of the abatement is just over $6 million, $6,173,000. Um, over 10 years. That's over, over the 10-year 10 10 years. period, That's that is right. correct. And that represents approximately 68% of the entire ab abatement relative to the other taxing jurisdictions. So, so all that to say, <coughs> excuse me, that we um, will continue to partner with um, organizations and businesses as new opportunities present themselves to see if we can um, provide additional opportunities for our students, such as the career ed classes and that type of thing. So we'll continue those partnerships where we can. Okay. Has, has LMV plugged into the Northland CAP? You know, I don't know the answer to that. Has LMV Actually, in? working on setting up a lunch with Rick McDowell okay. and the LMV okay. president to say, how does our partnership need to look? Because whether or not we have one, it's not an option. <laughs> you know I mean, I don't think. I mean, we're, we want to give, but we want you to give back to the educational environment. Right. And they've been, I mean, Rick has uh, indicated nothing but their interest in doing that. So is that okay. a financial commitment? Is that a partnership for instructional space or resources in some way? Uh, that meeting is being set up at this point. So uh, definitely we have to spur their partnership. Uh, but I think they're very interested. So should be, it should be mutually beneficial for them as they try and grow their organization and exactly. workforce. and Definitely. And their employees are going to be sending their kids to our systems. So they want that exact uh, benefit for their kids. So I, I see something coming our way. Nothing right now, but okay. definitely see a partnership to be formed in some way. Great. And uh, I should re-mention that uh, we discussed previously that with regard to the BNB um, arrangement, that we we see that as a huge opportunity for us to partner with BNB in the future with regard to space for classroom instruction or those types of opportunities and we obviously have already partnering, partnered in terms of parking so <laughs> that's a great thing. So now, I'm sorry Kurt, Kurt has pulled up for me, he indicated that there's some thought issues on some of this in the, on the large view but this is uh, just a snapshot in time that Hollis and Miller has provided for us with regard to some of our additions so the first indicated is the Liberty High School gymnasium addition and the orange block shows for you uh, that the location there and how it would connect to the building and, um, we also have it in the blue over there on the on the uh, left side you can see the is that a change by the way addition. Carol is that a design That's, change I remember it being a little ang more angled am I just my it, memory well wrong? The, the map is perhaps angled differently than what we presented okay. before but it, we haven't changed it um, <clears throat> So yeah, so that would be the new gymnasium site, and if we go on to uh, another slide or two here. So some of these slides that are shown uh, were just in the form formative stages of developing the design, and, and uh, to share with you that we had a team of uh, teachers, teacher leaders from the buildings uh, that would join in on the design consultations, and certainly Dr. Adams was at the table as well as assistant principals. And so, uh, we looked at a, a few ideas in terms of how the design could play out, and if we're going to continue on to the next one. So this is um, a, a viewpoint from the south side of the new uh, gymnasium, which, um, as a reminder, is a competitive gym and provides us with eight instructional spaces, which is an awesome uh, plus. Very, the team was very excited about that. Uh, we, Go another slide up, please. That's the activity center entry point. And um, you can't see it very well, but just behind where it says Blue Jay there in the middle of that, that's that instructional uh, flexible learning area within the, within the design. So we'll see another viewpoint as we scroll ahead again. So this shows you the first floor single port uh, diagram. And um, again, we captured a, a lot of space within this in terms of instructional opportunities, including the learning stairs, uh, capturing uh, a dual purpose for those areas. So we can go ahead and go to the next one. That shows uh, the first floor with a double court. Okay. This is the second floor view 
of uh, the, the uh, single court. And the next slide shows you the double court. But this actually identifies for you the, um, the eight learning areas, instructional learning uh, opportunities for us. So we, we will you know, have aerobics and uh, other types of classes that are currently taking place in unique areas within the building. <laughs> Uh, these slides, uh, again, were some of the conceptual design ideas that uh, were brought forward as we worked toward some of the interior designing. And um, go on up to the next one. Yeah, so this is uh, showing um, what those flexible learning stairs could look like. Uh, they're precedent images, basically, for how the events area and um, other concepts would, would play out for us. Can't just remember. just, just to illustrate again, the, the stairs themselves literally are stairs that they are literally go from stairs. One, one level to another. And the unique concept of this is also can be a classroom. Yes, um, absolutely. So, so kids sitting on the stairs yes. and, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I understand that kids these days love to sit on stairs to learn. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, you go ahead and go up to the the next slide. Okay, so these are some precedent images that were used uh, in the formation of the actual design. And you see that image there on the lower area of the beach. Some more uh, real life examples, followed by uh, the view for Liberty High School with the walking, the, the track area, and um, the scoreboard there on the wall. Okay, so that was Liberty High School. Then we have Liberty North. And uh, this shows you the uh, exterior view, the east view. And the materials obviously would um, uh, be matched to the existing structure for this. be complementary in nature. Okay, another view of that. Not a lot to get excited about looking at the outside of a building, but just uh, some progress for you. And then on the interior development for Liberty North, uh, these slides show you some of those areas where there would be collaborative furniture that would uh, cause a different type of learning environment for our students. And um, you can see the learning ledge, the learning wall, that type of area will be made available to them as well. So, um, so apparently, yes, we showed you this version at one point for the main level, and it's been modified since then. Uh, just to, and this again was based on dialogue with the uh, teachers at the table and Dr. Jacobs, and uh, really having a great dialogue with regard to what are the real needs and how can we best serve the students uh, given the square footage that we, we have available to us. So um, they've actually trapped a number of great opportunities for the students. And the next slide. Again, shows some more of that collaborative uh, furniture that could be positioned throughout. This is the upper level diagram. There's some slight changes modifying that, not, not a great deal. And then we get into the science lab areas, showing how we're going to share space and uh, not, not have the comprehensive lab set up for each of the classrooms. But classrooms will feed into those lab areas and they can uh, utilize space to a, a greater efficiency. The lower floor plan, followed by uh, another view of that. Again, with the learning sphere component. Okay. And then this just shows under construction and we have, again, some of those pictures on the other um, report. Uh, just a brief overview to bring you along, and uh, we'll continue to provide you with information and uh, better pictures as progress continues. So. Carol, I have, yes. I think last weekend. Pardon me. Last weekend, I think some water got into Lewis and Clark. Yes, we did have. Uh, is there? Is that all been cleaned up and the damage assessed? Yes, or? and. Um, Actually, it was pretty minimal damage, um, but in a particular classroom, and um, it has been addressed, and we're also making sure that we
provide for anything that was damaged in the process. It was, yes, it was definitely related to the construction and we don't know if it was just the, you know, we've had some interesting weather to deal with and there, the wind was high and so got in under the, the protective barrier. I will tell you that the, uh, at least one teacher affected by that is, has viewed it as an opportunity. Oh, there that's some, awesome. Well, I haven't heard that. Paper textbooks that were damaged and <laughs> taken that as an opportunity to move to more electronic resources. <laughs> Just don't set them next to the Just don't set temporary them. Yeah, wall. Unfortunately, the water <laughs> was on her desk. On the too, shelf. So, you know, <laughs> might have been an opportunity to clean up a number of things there. So. You know, so, so much of that stuff is uh, stuff that teachers actually pay for out of their own pocket. Mm -hmm. um, would you let her ask her if she needs help with that? We've already addressed okay. We've already addressed that. And and our insurance also provides an allocation too. But um, we definitely reached out to Mr. Palmer, Dr. Palmer, and um, had an inventory taken, whatever it was. And that would be our, that's our standard if we have anything that would happen throughout the system that was not the responsibility, certainly, of the individual, so. Are, are we, we've had bad weather. We have that had bad weather. That messes up pouring yes. of concrete yes. and other Yes, we were projects. eight, we, we have eight, I believe still eight days remaining um, weather protection days, mm -hmm. but we also know that we've got to hit the mark in terms of having these projects opened. And so as you, it, if you read through the, some of the bullet points, anytime we can seize an opportunity to accelerate a project, and especially uh, Universal Construction is doing a great job of working with those contractors to see if they can't really navigate the schedules differently to expedite the process and stand. So the weather hasn't set us back yet. Not yet, but we would rather be. Well, there's a lot of ground to cover. We, we have a really yes. nasty spring. will make it difficult. Yes. Though, Typical so. spring May. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yes, that is correct. Okay. So, but but They're that is being aware. watched very no closely. Point. And again, we'll accelerate when we can. Um, usually, that can also take place with some minimal costs. We have contingencies built into the budgets to ensure that we stay on track with regard to budget as well. So, okay. yes. but yes. Pray for great weather between <laughs> now and August, <laughs> mid-August. Very good. Any other questions for Carol? I, I should also also mention that our uh, our construction project timeline. Originally, we indicated that Liberty High School and Liberty North would be likely bid. It was March 17th was the date we had. Well, March 17th is has come and gone, and we haven't bid yet. But we are looking at bidding those projects the first of April with receiving the bids about April 29th, something like that. And then the second leg of that um, will be still at the end of June, uh, bid at the end of June. So, or maybe it's the bids open at the end of June. Yeah. So still progressing bit by bit. Very good. Thank you, Carol. Anything else for her? Just a couple quick updates for me in my report. Obviously, you see it online. You can ask any questions to Chad, but uh, system update. Carol, Bob, and I have done the Q&A at all 20 sites over the last month to uh, allow them to provide any feedback or see if we can clarify anything of all the different moving parts, whether it be technology, facilities, uh, any uh, the salary proposal, all of those pieces uh, as part of a district update. That's been done. Uh, we also continued our leadership courses, had two in the last um, month for a leadership team at Vision 2020 meeting. David may mention when he talks about board remarks. And then the, the most important piece is going on that we have to monitor right now, obviously, legislative session and the impact of that. So they were on spring break also last week uh, and go back to work or are at back, uh, back to work today and tomorrow. Uh, we know that the pace picks up significantly after spring break. Uh, bills have all been filed at this point, but now it's when they begin to move. So be ready. Uh, I mentioned that in the Friday update. Be ready to be called upon to provide feedback to our area legislators over the next six weeks because there will be a lot of education discussion, especially around transfers, around accreditation processes, uh, around Common Core, around all of those different things. If there's different bills moving, uh, we need to be uh, ready, and I'll provide you with uh, speaking points as well as MSBA, obviously, to give you your Friday updates, keeps you current. So keep keep uh, uh, attuned to those, and I'll do the same thing. If anything critical is coming up, uh, I'll try to let you know, and if you hear anything, you have any questions, let me know. So overall finance 
appears to be in a decent spot uh, for the state at this point. Resources seem to be, they're in the House budget at this point. It's not what the governor asked for, but it's significantly more than what we've gotten in the last few years. Uh, so that's a good start. Now the Senate will take a peek and, and see what happens. And then the, the big question will be what passes can we deliver? Because the state's still got to grow in order to make that happen. Because this is based, all of those revenues are based on state revenue growth, uh, which has to land. And then uh, do tax cut bills also pass? So uh, those have a uh, potentially different effect. So we have to monitor both of those things and then project out and make our best guess of what we'll actually have next year, which is always a guess. We know that's something. So that's legislative session. And uh, Desi uh, approved their intervention plan last week. That's out on the uh, website. If you haven't seen that at this point, more information to come. It's just really just now being published. So we'll let you uh, know once we have more information. Not a lot of impact on liberty, obviously, because we don't fall into those categories at this point. But as it starts to impact our neighbors, there are potentials for impact at other points. And uh, so we'll want to monitor. That's legislative. That's my report. Anything? Scott, back to you. Thank you. Okay, upcoming meetings are listed. Uh, there are several in the next couple of days, and if uh, the board doesn't mind, I'm going to skip 12.02 a little bit too here. Several of the meetings that we have coming up are related to the superintendent search. I just want to give a quick update in that uh, we began, as was reported in the Tribune, I talked to Ryan uh, this past week. Uh, we started with 27 resumes. We thought we got a very solid field, a very solid group of people that applied for the position. Uh, we spent a lot of time going through that information and uh, talking as a board how we wanted to proceed. We narrowed that down to 12 to 15 at one point, and then we further narrowed that to uh, seven or eight, started some phone interviews, and then this week began the actual on-site interviews with five people. Uh, we hope to wrap that up by the end of day Wednesday. Thursday, we'll be meeting again. And again, all these meetings are posted. Uh, we will meet again Thursday morning to discuss the final candidates and exactly where we go from there. So we are pretty much on track to an April 1st uh, type decision, but it may not be. We may take a few days after that, depending on what happens in the next few days. Uh, we've always said that we're not we're not marching towards a date necessarily. We're looking for the right leader to uh, be the next superintendent of Liberty Public Schools, and um, I think we're on we're on our way to doing just that. So, any other comments from board members? Uh, the only other comment I would make is that uh, personally, I was extremely pleased with the quality of and number of candidates that we had to had to look at initially. It was a pretty exciting place to start. from. And it, I think it would be fair to add that it, it, it's turned out to be truly a national search, too, it's, so, it's, which is equally exciting. A good mix of in-state, out-of-state. Yes. Very good. Okay, that will take us to 12.01 board committee reports. And David, do you have a Vision 2020? Yeah, quick, quick update. We met, uh, the Vision 2020 group met on March 4th, and... Um, this year, just as a reminder, the objective um, is to focus on how we can help every student develop kind of a, a service civic um, dimension in addition to the, the core academic. Um, and we've kind of summarized it as how do we help students jump off the page as they um, leave Liberty schools. And um, the group met a lot of uh, input from Marley and a team that um, has been doing some research. She alluded to um, a survey that was done of current students, former students, parents, um, and it was very helpful for the Vision 2020 group to get a better understanding of how do those individuals um, perceive their experience here, what are they taking from their experience here, what else would they like to take from their experience here in Liberty. Um, and it was, I think it was very helpful to bring that insight to the group uh, and the discussion. Um, can't say enough about the people who have committed to be part of the Vision 2020 group. It's been a very um, active dialogue over the last few years, um, and they continue to be very committed to helping us advance you know, what we can do for kids in the district. Um, the thing that I wanted to highlight, though, uh, overall was 
the energy um, that some of the educators that Marley brought into the conversation, brought into the conversation. They're very enthusiastic about how do we help make sure we're building these foundational skills for our young people to be successful. Academics are incredibly important. Um, we're not saying that those aren't, um, but helping make sure that we've got kids that are equipped to go and be successful, um, whether they're working, whether they're going on to more education, um, and the educators are really energized around it. If I have the facts right, there's another meeting early May, um, and th at that meeting, um, Marla and the team are going to bring in a proposal, um, and I think April and Marty are going to be instrumental in helping shape how that proposal works. Uh, but the idea is, what can we pilot in the fall of 2014 in both high schools? Um, scope of 50 to 100 students, I think, is the current thought although I'm sure that may be refined as, as it goes forward, um, to help really enhance what kids are getting out of the experience in the high schools. Um, and a uh, lot, lot of good work going into it. Um, I view this as an and project that's kind of tacked on top of the full-time jobs that these people have, um, but it was really energizing to see how they're starting to think about how does it really redefine what we do within the high school environment and then trickle down to the middle school and elementary environments as well. So um, hats off to all the folks who have been involved with it so far. I, was, I came out of that meeting really psyched um, and look forward to good things, look forward to the good things coming out of it um, for our kids next fall. Very good. Any other board, sorry, board committee reports? If not, that takes us to the end. Board remarks. Any final board remarks? Real quick. Mr. Abbott? Yeah, if you don't mind. Everybody has on their desk, but I'd like to point out to you and uh, anybody watching on TV that the Blue Jay Nation has formed a Liberty High School Hall of Fame, and they are having a celebration with their first uh, induction class on March 29th. I know there's an incredible amount of stuff on all of your plates, and especially this time of the year, but if you can, I would really encourage you uh, to attend um, and pass the word. So it's really a wonderful, wonderful program, and it would be great to start the first year off right. Very good. Any other remarks? Thank you. I'm going to make a couple, only just to um, thank this board. It's been a very busy couple of weeks for this group, and um, it, it, it's truly been a pleasure to work with six other people that have no personal agendas, that are not working to their own end, that are working together to do what's right for this district. Um, Kim Marie and Lori have worked tirelessly on questions and uh, some interviews on that they did. David and, and I'm, I'm gonna get in trouble when I start mentioning names, but David and Brennan made phone calls. Um, Andy and Charlene, we keep saying they're just going to make the final decision for us. Yeah, you're just going to tell them what to do. No. <laughs> but it really has been a pleasure. It's been extremely busy. I think we have eight board meetings. This week we have eight board meetings in three and a half days. Eight times we're getting together. So it's been a lot of time, a lot of work, but it's been a pleasure to do it with this group. So thank you all for that. And we'll keep rolling, keep moving forward. Onward. That's right. Okay, we need a motion to adjourn. Uh, actually, we need to adjourn back to close. Is there a motion to that effect? So mm -hmm. that we adjourn back to close session. Chris, is that okay? It, it actually needs to be read. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I move the board order to adjourn to close session, including any record or vote for the purpose of discussing legal, privileged communications with district attorneys, personnel, and preparation for negotiations with employee groups as provided by law section. 610.021 subsection 139 and 13 of the revised Missouri statute. Second. Any further discussion? If not, Sandra, please call roll. Friend? Yes. Charlene? Yes. David? Yes. Kim Marie? Yes. Andy? Yes. Lori? Yes. Scott? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. We're adjourned to close. <laughs>